There's no shortage of information on the web in regards to retirement, whether it be in Canada, the U.S., or people leaving uh, North America um, completely and retiring in a place like Mexico or Brazil or whatever the case may be. And I wanted to do this video because um, not only do I have some friends that um, believe that retiring in the U.S. is far superior to Canada, but I believe that there's a lot of people that um, might be thinking of leaving Canada to retire, um, say, in the U.S. or, or vice versa. Um, people um, might leave the U.S. Um, for other reasons that they have. Um, one of the reasons might be their American pension will go farther in Canada as far as uh, exchange rates go, or even in some other foreign countries. So let's just take a look. This, this is a really informative uh, website um, for a lot of things, but Investopedia. So um, <clears throat> I guess the, the key takeaways, according to this, is, is what kind of retirement systems do both countries have? And as you know, um, if you're a Canadian, we have the um, RRSP, the uh, Registered Retirement Savings Plan, and we have the Tax-Free Savings Account, which is akin to the U.S. traditional um, and Roth IRAs. Um, our Canadian retirement accounts have more generous contribution limits and fewer distribution limits than American accounts. Canada's pension plan for seniors, Old Age Security, or OAS, is funded by general tax revenue, so just general money that comes off your paycheck, while American Social Security is funded by payroll taxes. And Canada's single-payer health insurance is available to citizens throughout their life. So in Canada, we pretty well have health care that is free right across the board. I know that there are some um, costs involved. Um, I know if, uh, you know if you have to be treated for cancer, there are sometimes uh, different levels of drugs that you can get that require you to pay um, and other um, illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis and so on require that as well. Now, in America, Medicare is eligible only to those 65 and older and covers a lower percentage of medical costs. So, you know, in Canada, you're, when you go into retirement, you've saved for retirement. You really don't have to worry about having um, large sums of money put aside in case that you have a really serious medical uh, emergency, whether it be a heart attack or cancer or a transplant or whatever the case may be. So a major benefits for Canadians, as I've said, is the uh, universally funded healthcare system, which provides them with essential medical services throughout their lives, as well as retirement without co-pays or deductibles. Now, in contrast, unless they are disabled or extremely low income, Americans have no single payer insurance until they reach age 65 when they can qualify for Medicare. Even that is far from comprehensive. Medicare covers around 50% of healthcare costs. A 2001 study by the Employee Benefit Research Institute estimates that 65-year-old couples without employer health coverage will require about $600 or $360,000 to comfortably afford Medicare premiums and out-of-pocket medical expenses in retirement. Now, from what I have read and seen, a high percentage of Americans um, age 50 and up are lucky if they have $25,000 saved for their retirement. So how are you going to come up with $360,000 or more um, in retirement to pay for health care? And I believe that that's a huge downside on the U.S. side as compared to Canada. We're in Canada you really don't have to worry about um, having to pay any kind of health insurance. So the money that you've saved for retirement, even if it isn't a, a huge sum, isn't in jeopardy. Now, 
Key differences, retirement savings plans. When it comes to saving for retirement, Canada and America both offer individuals similar financial vehicles with similar tax advantages. The contribution limits, RRSP versus IRA and 401k. In Canada, the, the RRSP allows investors to get a tax deduction throughout your working life with the understanding that when you retire, you will pull that money out of that RRSP at a lower tax bracket because you're no longer working. And you can make contributions until you're 71. And the government sets maximum limits on the amount that can be placed into an RRSP. Currently, it's 18% of a worker's pay, up to 29,210 for 22. Um, and then it's going up to 30,000 in 23. Investors can contribute more, but additional sums over 2,000 will be hit with penalties. Now, in the States, they have traditional um, investment or R -R IRAs, um, and they're more limited than their Canadian counterpart. The IRS has set the maximum contribution for traditional IRAs at 6,500 per year. Now that's a huge difference from 30,000 that you can contribute to your retirement in Canada um, down to 6,500 in the US. So I think that's a check mark for Canada for sure. Um, now also in Canada, you can contribute um, between five and $6,000 depending on what the limit is into a TFSA each and every year. So um, that is a plus for Canada. Now, um, people age 50 and over can sock away an additional 1000 per year in 2023 as part of a catch-up contribution, which again, $1,000 isn't much to be, uh, you know, isn't going to do that much of a, a, a plus for you. Now, IRAs carry a 10% tax penalty if funds are withdrawn before the taxpayer reaches the age of 59 and a half. However, there is a special exemption at age 55 called the 72T that allows distributions without a penalty. Now, define contribution plans, which include American 401k plans offered through an employer, are more comparable to RSPs. The annual contribution limit for 2023 is 22,500. And those who are age 50 and over can contribute an additional 7500 per year for a total of 30000 So that's a good thing. IRA contribution age in the SECURE Act. The setting every community up for retirement enhancement SECURE Act was signed by President Trump in 2019. The act eliminates the maximum age for traditional IRA contributions, which was previously capped at 70 and a half years old. However, Americans who turned 70 and a half years old in 2019 still needed to withdraw their required minimum contributions in 2020, or they incurred a hefty 50% penalty of the RMD. Those who turned 70 and a half years old in 220 are not required to withdraw RMDs until they are 72. First requirement withdrawal needs to occur before the following April 1st. So individuals who turned 70 in 2019 could have waited to withdraw their RRSP until April 1, 2020. They were then required to take another RMD by the following December 31st and every December 31st thereafter. Um, RMDs are required at age 72. So withdrawals and taxes. Withdrawals from an RSP can occur at any time, but are classified as taxable income, which becomes subject to withholding taxes. When you turn 71 in Canada, you must convert your RSP into a retired, um, an RRIF, which is a registered retirement income fund. For American taxpayers, traditional IRAs and 401ks are structured to provide the same sorts of benefits, whereby contributions are tax deductible, and capital gains are tax deferred. However, withdrawals or distributions are taxed at the person's income tax rate. Okay. So Canada's TFSA versus American Roth IRA. Canada's TFSA is fairly similar to Roth IRAs in the United States. Both these retirement focused vehicles are funded with after tax money 
meaning there's no tax deduction in the year of the contribution. However, both accounts offer tax-free earnings growth and withdrawals are not taxed. Contribution limits for TFSAs and Roth IRAs. Canadian residents over the age of 18 can contribute up to 6000 as of 2022. And that goes back from the time somebody turns 18. So if somebody's 40 years old and they haven't contributed to their TFSA yet, they can go back each year and take the, the maximum of each year and contribute in a lump sum. So... Um, Provided they turn 18 in 2009, the year accounts originated. So you can, you can go back and, and uh, catch up on your TFSA, which can be huge. The annual maximum contribution to a Roth IRA is 6500 for 23 or 7500 with the $1,000 catch-up contributions for those 50 and over. Also, there's no limit on when one must stop making contributions and begin withdrawing money with either of these accounts, which, as I've said in, in uh, videos before, you know, you really, really want to get as much money into your TFSA as you can when you're younger, because the, the significance of getting maximum government benefits when you get older is a really, uh, it's a game changer. So, advantages of TSAs over Roth, over Roth IRAs. TFSAs offer two significant advantages. Young Canadians saving for retirement are able to carry over their contributions to future years, while such an option is not available in the States. For example, if a taxpayer is 35 years old and unable to contribute 6000 in their account due to an unforeseen outlay, next year the total allowable amount accumulates to 12000 and it just keeps going up each year um, that you get older and you can contribute it all in one lump sum. The contribution limits on the TFSAs have changed. At one time it was $10,000 and then it was five and now it's six. While sums equivalent to contributions can be withdrawn at any time, distributions of earnings out of a Roth IRA must be classified as Qualified in order to avoid taxes. Qualified distributions are those made after the account has been open for five years and the taxpayer is either disabled or is at least 59 and a half years old. Canada's plan does, does offer more flexibility in terms of providing benefits for those planning retirement. Now here's some key differences in government pensions. Both the US, United States and Canada provide workers with a guaranteed income once they reach retirement age. However, these federal pension plans differ from each other in several ways. So we have our Canada Old Age Security, or OAS, and it's financed by Canadian tax dollars and provides benefits to folks 65 and older. The CPP is funded by payroll deductions, just like the Social Security is in the United States, makes benefits available as early as age 60 in Canada, the Guaranteed Income Supplement, GIS, is available. available to the very poorest Canadians. Now, I've stressed in other videos the importance of the TFSA in getting the maximum uh, amount of benefits possible. And here's another prime example why that's important. Because in the eyes of the government, TFSA is not income, anything that you pull out of it. So if you had invested $30,000 in a TFSA in a really good um, company stock in the markets and, you know, it, it increased 5 or 10% each year, um, you're going to have a substantial amount of money in your uh, TFSA when it comes time to retire. And that isn't going to count in your um, when the government um, does your calculations to see if you get the guaranteed income supplement. Old age security provides benefits to people 65 and older. Although there are complex rules to determine the amount of the pension payment, typically a person who has lived in Canada for 40 years after turning 18 is qualified to receive the full payment as of October 20, uh, 2022. Uh, of 685 per month from the age of 65 to 74, and then it goes up 10% um, after 
somebody turned 75. So additionally, for the time period of 20, October 22nd to December 22nd, guaranteed income supplements, $616 or $1,023, depending on if you're married or not, and allowances, 1013 but 300 are provided for pensioners with an annual income up to $38,000. Now, the allowance is if your spouse is older than you. So if your spouse is over 65 or 65 and older and is collecting um, old age security and the GIS, if you are below 65, so say you're 62, you are entitled to this amount here, the allowance. And it's on a sliding scale. Um, the closer that a couple's income gets to $38,448, the lower this payment would be. So I'll say it again. <coughs> Excuse me. If you as a couple have good income from TFSAs, it makes a huge difference in the amount of uh, money that you're going to get from the government. Now, there is a clawback on the uh, old age security in Canada um, for folks that make uh, over uh, a certain amount of money. And I believe right now it starts in the, in the high 70,000s. And if you make over 120, I believe it's 128 or $130,000 right now, you, uh, they claw back your uh, old age security completely. But you know, anybody that uh, has an income of $130,000 doesn't need it most likely anyway. So um, now it's important to note to subsidize universal health care and pensions, Canada imposes higher income taxes on its citizens than the United States does on its residents. And, you know, that's an interesting thing because even though we might pay some higher taxes, um, in Canada, you're not going to get um, you know, uh, sick with something like cancer or a heart attack or a transplant or one of, one of the really high ticket items that healthcare um, problems in the U.S. and and that could literally cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. From what I've read, the biggest um, the biggest uh, reason for people going bankrupt. Is healthcare. So there it is right there. Most common causes of bankruptcy in the U.S. is medical debt. Due to the increase in medical care costs, it's becoming increasingly harder for patients to keep up with their bills. In fact, much of this care has left Americans with additional costs they didn't anticipate. Loss of income, credit card debt, so on. So that, that's scary, in my opinion, to, uh, you know, to live in a country that uh, you, know, you can lose everything that you own um, and work for all your life because you get sick. So that's, uh, to me, that's a huge uh, plus for the C Canadian side uh, um, retirement system, for sure. Okay, so fast fact. Generally, Canada's retirement programs are considered safe as they are funded out of general tax revenues. In the United States, there have been continuous fears that the Social Security system, which is instead funded through payroll taxes on employee ages, will become underfunded. And um, in the U.S., the political system seems to be, um, you know, constantly going back and forth um, with this scenario of, you know, um, lowering um, Social Security uh, payments um, to the population. So it says individuals, individuals are eligible to receive partial benefits upon turning 62 and full benefits, 33.45 per month is the maximum in 2022, and 36 and 23 once they are 66 or 67 depending on the year of birth. Now, I think both 
retirement systems are quite complicated in, in the way they do all their calculations. But um, from what I've seen on a lot of different um, YouTube videos and, and uh, podcasts and so on, a lot of very low income Americans, um, and you know, you got to consider that the minimum wage in America is, I believe, is about $8 an hour. So a lot of folks um, that I've seen are lucky if they're getting $600 a month in Social Security payments. Um, and that's all they get. Um, whereas in Canada, you know, you've got CPP, you've got old age security, and then you've got GIS. So a, a Canadian who's less well off um, can be around $2,000 a month in, um, in income from the government programs. So, um, <clears throat> in, in Canada, to get the full old age security, you need to have worked or lived, I should say, in Canada for 40 years and below 40 years, then, um, you get a decrease in old age security. Um, in the States, they use, uh, what they call credits and they can earn additional credits to increase their payments by delaying, um, taking their social security until age 70. Um, can a Canadian retire full-time in the U.S.? A Canadian citizen cannot re retire full-time in the U.S. without going through the proper immigration channels. There's a way that Canadian can retire part-time in the U.S. or are legally allowed to spend six months a year in the U.S. without needing visas or permits. Um, can you collect U.S. Social Security in Canada? Yes. A U.S. citizen can collect Social Security if they live in Canada or elsewhere, as long as they are eligible for Social Security. Does Canada tax U.S. retirement income? Yes. Canada taxes U.S. retirement income is different for the specific types of retirement income. Social Security is only taxed in the country of residence, so if you receive U.S. Social Security income and live in Canada, that income will be taxed in Canada and not in the U.S., Pension income will be taxed both in the U.S. and Canada, but in Canada, the U.S. portion is available as a foreign tax credit. So, I guess the long and the short of it is this. The, the biggest issue um, with retiring in, in either Canada or the U.S., there's a couple of things. Number one, housing. Housing is definitely can be more expensive in Canada. Now, that said, in the US, there are a lot of areas where housing is, is just as expensive as, as a lot of Canadian cities, if not a lot more. Now, where some people will say it's a lot cheaper to live in the U.S., um, generally they're referring to trailer parks and mobile home parks. And in those situations, they don't own the land typically underneath their trailer. And lot rents are becoming quite high. So you can be paying between $500 and $1,500 a month in lot rents. And if you have to convert that from Canadian funds, so if you're a Canadian and you're getting Canadian pension and you need to convert $1,500 or, or even $800 into Canadian funds, right now the exchange rate is, is about, it's a dollar, it costs you a dollar 36 Canadian for one U.S. dollar. So it, it's a substantial amount of money. There are still places in Canada where you can buy a house for under $500,000. Um, and you can buy mobile homes in Canada, um, but generally a lot of them are uh, limited to six-month occupancy um, because, of, uh, because of winter and, and zoning and so on. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think that, that to me, 
the biggest um, downside that Americans face is um, political uncertainty. Um, it's a very divided country at this point as far as their political system goes. And to be f fully honest, um, Canada is getting a little bit uh, divided uh, at this point as well. I don't think it's as extreme as it is down in the U.S. I still think that it's safer to live in a Canadian city than it is in a U.S. city, um, considering gun laws and so on. Um, the um, biggest downside, I believe, is is uh, security of your of your um, your assets in Canada. Um, you know, if if. If, if you stand the chance of losing your life savings to a, a, an illness, uh, an emergency illness, um, to me, I, I, I really would find it hard to sleep at night knowing that I could wake up any time um, and have a heart attack or, or get cancer or whatever the case may be and end up having to do a copay or, or you know, an, an out-of-pocket expense in a hospital. Uh, it to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, because as we see here, most common causes of bankruptcy due to the increase in medical care costs, it's becoming increasingly harder for patients to keep up with their bills. Much of, much of this care has left Americans with additional costs they didn't anticipate, according to a Harvard study. Sixty-two percent of all bankruptcies have, bankruptcies have been spurred by medical debt, and to me that. That, that's the, the contributing factor right there to um, why I believe, anyway, that living in a country with universal health care like Canada far supersedes um, any advantage that there might be um, to living in a, in a country like the United States. Now, I've actually had people um, argue the point of if you live in, you know, in, a, in a warmer climate down in the U.S., like a place like Florida, I guess, you can, uh, you know, you can have a better climate to live in and, and those things. And, and I can, I, I can understand that. But at the same time, um, you know, if you have a heart attack under a palm tree and uh, um, cost you $250,000 for a hospital bill, um, I'd much rather be sitting in my living room in Canada with the heat going in the house. So um, you've got that to think about. So um, to finish up, um, there are a lot of different reasons why somebody would retire in Canada or the U.S., but I still believe that Canada um, is a great country, and um, there are a lot of positives to living in Canada, um, one of them being our social net system, and secondly, um, our health care system, and, uh, you know, it's... Um, the political unrest in the U.S., um, you know, is, is, is getting to the point where the Republicans and the Democrats can't seem to come to too many uh, um, conclusions on a bipartisan basis. Um, and some would say that, uh, you know, the, uh, the one political uh, side of the equation um, is not pro-poor uh, people. Or retired people, um, they're more for the rich, and they seem to be controlling a lot of uh, what goes on in the United States. And you know, there's talk of uh, decreasing uh, social uh, security payments, and uh, even though some of the other uh, parties have tried to do uh, do reform in regards to um, you know the uh, drug. Uh, environment in the states as far as uh, prescription drugs for uh, insulin for diabetes and stuff like that um, it, uh, that's something that you don't have to worry about here in Canada so anyhow if uh, anybody was ever wondering about the differences between retirement in Canada versus America um, I hope this uh, was a bit of an eye-opener for you and, and uh, gave you some good information Please uh, leave me some comments with, uh, with your thoughts on retiring in, in the U.S. or Canada. And uh, please subscribe to my channel and like my video. 
and uh, thanks very much.